ലക്ചർ <laughs> thank you so much sir and thank you all chairperson and moderators for uh, giving this opportunity and also allowing me to can i share my screen uh, yeah yeah i have not blocked from in my side anything no no, no. yeah all right hmm. so thank you dr deshpande and all the senior members of uh, for this uh, session and my talk is on addressing medical legal challenges with nabh accreditation thank you aws team for giving me this opportunity and this is my financial interest i work with nabh on a uh, uh, honorary capacity to passionately to improve the quality of eye care services and uh, you all know ophthalmic practice uh, practice itself is becoming uh, hazardous and risky and practicing defensive medicine is inevitable and our mutual faith has been replaced with mutual suspicion and these are uh, daily uh, has become daily occurrences now and uh, also in ophthalmology it is uh, catching up and most of these events are preventable manageable and identifiable if we can find the root cause analysis and uh, try to prevent this so these are some of the medical legal challenges unique to our specialty the surgical camps where cluster infections are uh, a bit common the community outreach activity where there is no support services of the parent organization day care surgery and follow up issues particularly some emergency happening after the uh, <coughs> surgical procedure and there is a wide variation between the paid services free services and charity units and now the insurance issue with that with its attendant documentation and follow up issues so we can't be like a ostrich that it cannot happen to us and most of us are ignorant because it's not included in our medical curriculum and nobody wants to talk it about it openly and many of us feel it may not happen to us and let's deal with it when it happens so why do patient complaints when uh, the standards or the expected care is not delivered or they perceive that the standards are not followed so many of the patients are used to standards everywhere in other service industry and you all know happy patient don't sue the doctor so unhappy patients uh, expect these avoiding injury to patients effective evidence based medicine dignity when the care process delivery timely care reduction with the delays from the receiver and provider avoiding wastage with reference to supplies particularly the consumables and equitable care so medical negligence you all know the act of omission and act of commission uh, without <coughs> having the standard of care and these are some of the acts of omission failure to perform certain test <laughs> giving appropriate uh, counseling failure to maintain aseptic precautions asking about drug sensitivity and systemic disease and ruling out certain pathologies for example chronic dacryocystitis in cataract surgery and wrong side happens right wrong side or site errors happen most commonly in ophthalmology and this is the common cause for wrong side surgery the miscommunication and communication lag and the majority of these are preventable Uh, if you see that many of these are system related factor or process related factor where certain standards if we are follow we can reduce this incidence so if we have to provide standard of care we have to understand the basic tenets of medical care and accreditation standards can help us to prevent medical legal challenges as you all know the standards is a stumbling block if the quality and safety fails the moment you reduce the risk the quality improves so what are the medical legal challenges faced by ophthalmologists and hospitals and basically you can classify this into four categories failure to comply with the legal and professional responsibilities 
problem related to patient safety, medication errors and care management, administrative errors, particularly related to tariff and billing. And the fourth one is failure of communication, inadequate consent and medical records. So basically patients sue the doctor because failure to comply with the legal and professional responsibilities. And what we should do is follow all the protocols, particularly post COVID and COVID time, you have to <coughs> diligently follow the government regulation and rates. The second aspect is having statutory and legal requirement. India is a country where the healthcare is regulated by so many laws, uh, related and unrelated laws. So you have to comply with them. Of course, it is difficult, but the healthcare institutions have to understand these legal requirements and comply with them to avoid medical legal challenges. The objective, so accreditation standards have a mechanism to regularly update the licenses, registration, MOUs, and certifications. And if you have the system in place, it's easy to avoid these hassles. Uh, fourth one, uh, third one is related to the biomedical wastage. Throwing biomedical wastage is a crime now. So you have to follow this norm standards, focus on these uh, source segregation and proper uh, biomedical wastage segregation. The fourth one is related to the medications uh, under the Drug and Cosmetic Act. It provides from safe storage, preservation, prescription, and dispensing of drugs. And the healthcare institution has to ensure safe administration. And statutory compliance related to HR is one of the key areas where a lot of problem happens for the hospital, particularly ESI, Provident Fund, Profession Tax, the Graduity, and the Minimum Wages Act. And if, you, if the healthcare provider knows this, and we can avoid these issues. And the next one is related to the conduct of doctors and nurses. Many of our people don't understand the medical council requirements. They, it, has, it is a moral authority and legally binding on them. It's important they understand these rules and regulation and follow them. And right of the patients. Most of us uh, uh, <coughs> take consent only on paper and it is not a proper consent taking mechanism. Accreditation standard enforce and uh, focus on taking a proper consent with all the regulations and requirement. And it is obligatory for the service providers to provide all the info recorded to the patient on demand. And these are some of the medical legal challenges. The next part is challenges faced with reference to patient safety and medication errors. You all know accidents, uh, particularly in the last one year or so, in many of the COVID hospitals had fire accidents and many patients uh, <coughs> died because of <coughs> fire accidents. Standards focus on fire safety mechanism and proper emergency services and uh, having a good system for fire uh, extinguishers as well as uh, fire related uh, systems really help us during the emergency system. Safe infrastructure and alternative supply are very important. Standards focus on having alternative medical gas supply, emergency exit system, electricity, water supply and communication systems. And the standards focus on not only these essential systems, but also on surveillance like CCT camera, as well as the crash cart and hazardous items. And uh, the most common uh, problem in hospitals is related to the tariff and billing and uh, standards ensure that standard billing and transparent tariffs are followed in the hospital. And the last part is failure of communication, particularly inadequate consent and patient education mechanism and also failure to maintain medical records. So as you all know, timely care is very, very important. It has to be like a free flow, like a flowing river. And uh, one of the standard indicator is uh, focusing on time taken for care delivery in emergency, ward, OP, and uh, operation theaters. So this really helps in uh, <clears throat> making the patient satisfied and happy. The common cause of litigation is CCC failure. What I mean is consent, communication, cost, and having a complaint feedback. Accreditation standard focus on these mechanism with reference to the PRE chapter, <laughs> patient rights and education chapter. And this really helps us in reducing the consent and communication related issues. And as you all know, most successful doctors are those who have good communication skills, accreditation skills, re, uh, accreditation standards for have an entire chapter and focus on this we see that is very, very important. And importance of informed consent, as you all know, medical records uh, really save our day in the court of law. Mistakes we cannot defend is wrong eye, wrong eye well, wrong surgery, wrong medication, and wrong patients. And if you have st standards and systems in place, these preventable mistakes 
uh, particularly uh, can be avoided with the use of checklists. Uh, and standards focus on having a safety checklist, not only for cataract surgery, but also for other eye-related uh, surgeries where you have a sign-in, time-out, and sign-out system. This really helps in avoiding the uh, errors that can lead to sentinel events. <clears throat> These are some of the statutory documentation where accreditation standards have a major role to play with reference to requirement from the clinical documentation, uh, notifiable disease, employee record, as well as the transplantation act. And maintenance of medical records, very, very important. And this is one of the most common non-compliance in uh, accreditation uh, visits or assessments. And this, as you all know, acts as a number one witness in litigation. And this should be arranged in the chronological order. So how does accreditation help in reducing medical legal challenges? Good infrastructure is directly proportional to safe care. Process, documentation, for, and soft communication skills really help us in reducing the medical legal uh, <clears throat> challenges. Licenses in place ensure safety in facing medical legal challenges. A uh, good structure, infrastructure, and process give good outcomes. If we give good outcomes, there, there won't be any medical legal challenges. And we can, even if we have them, we can boldly face them. Problems are not stop signs, they are guidelines. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Nirmal, for giving a nice talk and the problems that are causing the medical legal cases that you have revealed very nicely. Now, I will request Dr. Pankaj uh, Varshnava to talk yes. uh, on his subject. So Sorry that I given the uh, next place to you after the Nirmal because he was to go in another uh, session. Yeah, no thank problem. you for adjusting that. Thank you, Pankaj, sir. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, yes, sure, sure. At present, it is not visible. I'm you, not visible. You, uh, you are visible, but your screen okay. is not visible. Can Click to, to share to screen. screen. There is a green arrow below. I have started. Uh, there is a niche in the lower part of the screen. There is a green arrow. Yeah. Share the screen. Oh, Yeah, please. Yeah, I'm trying to share this problem. Uh, so I want to share it from my computer. How can how should I? I think it from is shared computer now. only. Shared. You have to share. It is already shared, yeah. sir. Don't worry. It is shared. Okay. You start. You start now. Uh, yes, you can start now. Just a minute. Oh, you have gone back. Uh, yes. Yes, yes, continue. Yeah. Uh, has it come? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it has come, but it, it should be in slideshow. Now, now it is in the slideshow. Continue. My topic is consumer case study in end of thalmitis. As you know, med medical negligence is an act of commission or omission, and it is defined by Bollum's test, which is, says that failure to act in accordance with the standards of average prudent man at that time and place. What is the burden of proof is on the complainant. If doctor put, put some defense, then he has to prove it by valid consent or by the one of the using one of the accepted methods. There are defenses to avoid suit, which are which include records, which is the number one, consent, voluntary non-fit injury, therapeutic privilege, error of judgment, contributory negligence, and vicarious liability. <coughs> In end of thalmitis case, liability arises from poor pre-op workup, poor surgical environment, delay in diagnosis, delay in treatment, and delay in referring the patient to a vitreoretinal specialist. First case I am giving is the National Consumer Dispute Redressal Commission, where Sri Shamla Ladia versus Dr. O.P. Nair. Complaints were that negligence was alleged in operation and implantation of a poor quality lens which led to infection resulting in removal of his right eye. Tests were conducted prior to cataract surgery were done one month back. And patient says it is a case of receptor locator as the surgeon admitted that it is a case Timer, of- please. And yes, yes, you continue, you continue. And he said that referral letter did not mention the type of endophthalmitis. What the National Commission observed, it said that eye surgeon was qualified and experienced 
the complainant has not filed any evidence to prove that surgery or lens were of poor quality. That means he has failed to produce the evidence. Also, other six patients who had undergone cataract surgery with IOL were perfect without any infection. Hence, there was no evidence of cluster infection. Therefore, infection was not <coughs> the quality of the lens. Post-operative prescription dated 17-11-1997 clearly mentions that complainant had vision of 6 by 24. It means records help the doctor. Pre-op lab tests and medical checkup were conducted one month prior to surgery and were normal. Hence, there was no necessity to repeat the tests again unless the patient had some signs and symptoms. Opposite party, that is, the doctors referred the complainant to medical college at Jabalpur for management of infection. <laughs> we controlled and ultimately the eye was removed. <laughs> Referring a patient to a higher center is not a negligent act. Several medical texts, literature, and journals have revealed that endophthalmitis is a known complication of cataract surgery. <laughs> Further, intraocular infection is not only rampant in eye camps but also in hospitals, which include five star ones. And National Commission observed that only surgeon who does not have endophthalmitis is the one who does not operate. It means endophthalmitis is a known complication. Please make mute other people who are not talking. Please the problem make is general, them mute. Despite the best possible care, my steps cannot be avo always avoided. It is not the surgeon who is always to be blamed, although he is responsible for the surgery. In view of aforesaid findings and patterns, National Commission was of the view that opposite parties acted as per standards of practice and there was no negligence or deficiency in service. Ah, was dismissed and or no order as per. Please, please yeah. mute yourself, those who are not speaking. All coordinators is, is take care of it. All coordinators. Job. Lawrence coordinator Club, should take care Kurja of that. Conducted an eye camp. Hello. Kurja conducted an eye camp with Dr. R.M. Sahai of Sahai Hospital, Jaipur. The team operated 88 patients on 21st April 1986 and Dr. Sahai left Kurja for Moradabad for another eye camp. The operated eyes of the patients were irreversibly damaged due to post-operative infections. Dr. Sahai returned on 24th April and undertook himself for some treatment but could not succeed. Similar myshap occurred on the what's on in the at Muradabad camp. Some of the victims were later sent to be treated at Dr. Sahai's hospital at Jaipur, but their condition did not improve. The inquiry showed that the source of infection, referred to as E. coli, was the normal saline used at the time of surgery. Dr. Sahai had himself brought all the medicines and surgical instruments. He had purchased the saline from a Messer Mehtab company at, of Jaipur, and he had invoice for that purchase. National alarm was created, and Supreme Court intervened and passed certain guidelines for eye camps, which I will not discuss at this moment. Third case is Shri Yadav Govind Dahatonde versus Dr. Shri Shashikant V. Pach Pacharne. It was Maharashtra. Code. Here, the complainant was having complained about the post operative endophthalmitis in left eye, but records showed that the patient had good vision on second follow up visit, but did not follow, follow the guidelines of instructions given by the doctor. And he did not use black goggles and was cleaning his eyes with dirty cloths. And this was mentioned on the OPD card of the patient. In the court, no expert evidence was produced by the complainant to prove the medical negligence. Hence, the appeal was dismissed and no order as to cost. So this gives an importance of expert opinion, which was further strengthened by Sathuraman Subramaniam Ayer versus Triveni Nursing Home. In this, National Commission considered the fact that there was no expert evidence on behalf of the complainant, so value of expert opinion was recognized. In Mrs. Shantaban Mujibai Patel versus Breach Candy Hospital, National Commission held that doctors are required to take risks while performing their job and merely because patient dies or has certain complications, it does not lead or does not establish deficiency in service or negligence on part I of... I request organizers to start the uh, time watch. Another case... Sir, it is already on. Already on. Yeah. 
So I am not able to see you monitor. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah, continue, Rob. In this, Supreme Court observed that police cannot proceed without obtaining opinion from government doctor or medical counsel, and criminal courts also have to obtain a medical expert opinion, and police cannot arrest a doctor in a routine manner. Conclusion. Records, records, records. Records are always helpful in fighting cases against them in the court of law. First, let the complainant prove his case with expert evidence. Then only you have to give your, your, your opinion. Deny each alleg allegation separately and don't accept any mistake. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj. Uh, you have uh, uh, nicely narrated the cases and how they are lost or win that clues you have also given. Thank you for the same. Now I will be speaking on effects of COVID-19 on the legal, medical legal aspects, because this is a threatening thing to the world and we have to go in detail for that. So I will be sharing my screen now. Uh, please, uh, organizers, please mute other people, those who are not speaking. Sir, a slight magnifier. Magnifier. Yes, magnifier. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. So, this is effects of the COVID-19 on legal liabilities on ophthalmic practice. So, the liabilities may be civil or criminal. The civil liabilities may be in the form of consumer cases, thinking of getting COVID to patients attending the hospital because of not taking proper precautions to prevent spread of the COVID. The patient may think that the doctor has not taken proper precautions for COVID purposes. And so, they, have, uh, they had a COVID uh, because of that. This may be in OPD or IPD, during emergency surgeries, during planned surgeries, either in um, uh, okay. uh, allow, uh, period or in the banned period or allowed period by the uh, pandemic rules. The other causes may be uh, muco, my, uh, mucormycosis, negligence in diagnosing the proper time, negligence in proper treatment, negligence in taking decisions of ex exenteration, not taking proper consents for loss of organ and disfiguration, particularly in children who can sue when they become adults. So this is a very important thing that only we take negligence, but here, we have to take the consent for disfiguration also because the exenteration may cause the disfiguration of the face, particularly in the children when they can sue when they become the adult. And so we you have to take the such um, precaution. Negligence um, liabilities arise in immunization negligence in immunization and negligence in not detecting or properly not taking the care of the um, um, symptoms, that is the emergency symptoms that happen because of the vaccines, there are also may happen. So the criminal liabilities are death under 304A, this because that is the uh, um, section which is charged to the doctors. A disfiguration because of mucormycosis surgery. This is recently has come and the proper consents and proper record will come to help the doctor or hospital. Doctor will not be held responsible under negligence. 
if the treatment is as per the standard textbooks and or accepted professional practice and still patient suffers a loss or injury or merely because a complication has occurred. So the complication is not the cause of consumer code to ingo because negligence is the basis for going in the court. The medical man is not a insurer. He does not warrant successfulness of the treatment or cure of the treatment. This is the decision given by the Supreme Court. The legal liabilities of the uh, Corona-19 may help happen in the solo practice or in trust or corporate hospital. The responsibilities are different. In pandemic as such, total health system is protected by my pandemic rules. Still, the right of consumer is protected to some extent. The legal liabilities are different in solo practice and trust hospitals. Under Consumer Protection Act, civil liabilities or negligence in solo practice, it is his responsibility as he is the owner of the hospital. So whether it is sued on the hospital or whether he is, it is sued on him, it is one and the same. In corporate trust or the government hospital, it is the hospital who is responsible. The Supreme Court, given the decision that the patient once they are admitted to such hospitals, it is the responsibility to satisfy that all possible care was taken and no negligence was involved in attending the patient. So this is the responsibility of the hospital. In fact, it is the hospital who engages the treating doctor. Therefore, it is their responsibility. So this is there is a triangle in that because the patient is paying to the hospital. So the hospital is the service provider and patient is the consumer. So the patient has the right to sue the hospital. Whereas the doctor is giving his services to the hospital. So the hospital is the service uh, consumer and doctor is the service provider. And so the patient cannot sue directly to the doctor because he has not paid to the doctor. This is the attitude of Supreme Court and a national uh, uh, commission uh, in some cases. And so they are protected in this way because the patients are not coming on the name of the doctor, but they are coming on the name of the hospital and the hospital is allotting the doctor. Therefore, no individual doctor is liable and can be held jointly or severely liable. Even visiting doctors or consulting doctors in private hospitals cannot be held liable. So this is also a very important thing. In private hospitals, there are visiting doctors. There are doctors who go and do the surgeries. And so the that hospital, if they he is it is collecting the fees and giving to the doctor the hospital becomes the liable for that the consumer does not avail services of such doctors individually by paying fees or consideration to those directs directly but in criminal liabilities and of negligence doctor and hospital both are responsible irrespective of what type of hospital it is so the in criminal liabilities doctor is cannot escape so in bitter bias, C1 then, the Supreme Court has given the decision that for every mishap or death during medical treatment, the medical man cannot be proceeded against for the punishment. So this is a very good protection given by the Supreme Court to the doctors that every case should not be taken that there is a negligence and fault of the doctor only. So thank you very much. So this is to be very much uh, care that one should take the here, I am stopping my sharing of the screen. I have saved about 3, 21 minutes. Nice thing. Uh, I am requesting the organizers to uh, see that the timer is visible to me also. Thank uh, you very much. You can pin now, the timer, organizers. You can pin the timer so that it is on the first number. Okay, okay. So first number. So I am not able to see anyway. So in case you are, you are able to see, you uh, just uh, yes, monitor. I'll let him. I'll let him. Yeah. Now I request Dr. Prakash Marathi uh, to give his uh, talk for post COVID practice norms in ophthalmology. Yes, uh, Dr. Prakash Marathi, please. Yes, sir. Is my screen visible? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, yeah. It is visible. Huh. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Yes, now my your uh, timer is visible. And my screen is also visible. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. Uh, good evening, all of you. 
I am thankful to organizers of All India Ophthalmological Society Conference, that is virtual 2021. And I'm also thankful to our chairperson, Dr. A. A. Deshpande, sir, for giving me this opportunity in this medical legal symposium. I think uh, last one and a half years, we have been passing through this phase of COVID. And post-COVID practice norms in case of ophthalmology, they are a little different. What practice we had done pre-COVID is not the same one. So pre-COVID, COVID and post-COVID, these are three eras you can classify as what practice was there before, before Corona, before COVID is not the same nowadays. So the topic allotted to me is practical oriented and that is in relation to post-COVID. So after COVID, in relation to ophthalmology, when the COVID came, people thought it is the disease to be handled by family physicians, then intensivists, ICU uh, consultants, and super specialists like physicians. And very less number of cases used to come to ophthalmologists when there was the complication in relation to ophthalmology. But then when the second wave came, and there were few complications in case of COVID patients, those who had diabetes, and then they had the oxygen also. And there was some relation and that mucormycosis was seen. And at that point of time, ENT consultants and ophthalmologists, they were very busy. It was so unfortunate that people who survived after COVID got this mucormycosis and they lost their eyes. They lost that shape of their face and it was unfortunate on their part. In few cases, the lives were also lost. Now the thing is, you have to be very careful when the patient comes to ophthalmologist with some redness, some eye pain, some headache, some pigmentation, some nose choking at and around orbit and nasal area, you can suspect mucormycosis. If the patient had history of corona and he is diabetic, and was on oxygen when he was admitted in the hospital. And in some cases when the steroids were given. So if that is the course, you must suspect mucormycosis and you should refer the patient to proper person, proper hospital. I think nasal endoscopy, that is the first thing you can advise to your patients, ask them to go to ENT specialist and the proper care has to be taken. Don't quit and don't try those patients and treat yourself in your own clinic setup or your own hospital. Whenever the patients are coming to you in your setup for some surgery, I think the norms are changed in today's era. You can ask for RT-PCR to be done for the patients so that before surgery, you are in a position that the person doesn't have COVID. In some cases, when you don't have time and RT-PCR is not that way possible, you can have that rapid antigen test. As most of you know, it is the false negative which is seen in case of rapid antigen. After negativity of rapid antigen test, even the person can be positive. So that particular thing you must keep in your mind. Whenever you are handling these patients of COVID in your indoor, in your operation theater, PP kit must be used by surgeon and the staff in the operation theater and indoor wards. Whenever the COVID corona patient is getting operated in your operation theater, probably that period of two hours, that fumigation you can do. And you can wait for next case to be operated. All equipments, linen, instruments, those have to be properly sterilized when you are using those things for the next patient. So whenever COVID corona patient is getting operated, it is the safety measures what you have to perform for your own, for your hospital staff, and not for only your own and hospital staff, but for other patients also, so that if proper care is taken, probably other patients will not be suffering from the same. In today's era, I think as one and a half years is gone after COVID corona, the whole world was facing that particular problem. And vaccination has started. Even in India, we could not complete total vaccination. Basically in the first phase of vaccination, the doctors were asked to get vaccinated and most of the medical fraternity, they are vaccinated. Second chance was given to the hospital staff, that is paramedicals. 
and even paramedicals are vaccinated see that your staff who is operating who is there in the operation theater as assistants nurses paramedicals should also get vaccinated suppose they are getting vaccinated there is less risk of complications due to corona covid and the same way suppose the general public the whole population of india gets vaccinated the whole world gets vaccinated in a proper way probably we will be in a position to fight corona in a proper way i think you must have heard about that delta variant nowadays probably we were, the cases in india were on the lower side even in maharashtra today's news is that probably that delta variant is going to trouble so we must pray god it shouldn't trouble us more so telemedicine also can be used in this post covid era but there has to be some disclaimer whatever medicines you have been prescribing for corona with telemedicine there are certain limitations because you are not seeing the patient physically so clinical judgment may not be perfect and with that rider with that disclaimer you can give that telemedicine treatment online medical checkup and consultations have already started because of this covid era so i think it is also the opportunity to project and promote your practice you cannot be just sitting at home you can you just cannot be aside and stop your practice face your practice face your patients take proper precautions and whenever the patient doesn't want to come to hospital and he wants to remain at home give these options to a patient so accept this particular thing with positivity medical record keeping is a must it has to be done sometimes you may feel that teleconsultation is given why to write something but you must keep record of these patients what type of treatment you have given what type of complaints the patient had what was the recovery and you should also not forget to collect the charges because medico legal aspects are also important for online online consultation there is one more thing going on there has to be some immunity to medical professionals for giving this online consultation and telemedicine business because in this covid era the norms of treating the patients were different like nothing was written about oxygenation and steroids and anti covid treatment to be given in the wards it was just the practically uh, means search thing by the doctors so that legal immunity medical legal immunity has to be given and for that associations like indian medical association they are fighting so protective gear you must use in your at, uh, premises when there is direct physical consultation there are changing government rules and regulations most of the times even government doesn't know what sort of rules what sort of rules they are applying so you have to be well acquainted with those rules interpretation of the rules should be proper what rules were there in the first wave in the second wave the rules are little different in this telemedicine and online consultation you can use social media also use of teleophthalmology mobile app artificial intelligence should also be promoted in your treatment as ophthalmologist you can involve family physician super specialist general ophthalmologist to interpret your results motivate your patients motivate their families and society at last that the way you have to tackle this corona you have to tackle this covid not from your end as ophthalmologists and doctors but it is the responsibility of each and everybody that is society and government at large you should make use of optometrists paramedics for taking online pictures of the patients pandas proto photographs various reports and sending them to higher centers for interpretation is a must involve various super specialists and interpretation and further management also can be facilitated because of that arrangement of online social awareness programs is the responsibility of medical profession which we all should do and with all these words i think i have tried to cover how to tackle medical profession in this post covid era i think i have finished my talk within time thank you so much each and everybody for the patient listening thank you so thank much thank you prakash uh you have finished talk in within time and given all the knowledge which is required and very nicely is put forward thank you very much thank now you. i will so uh, request uh, dr manoj chandra to talk about on the insurance problems and uh, he will nicely tell how the doctor should be protected with the help of the insurance yes please chandra
Dr. Manoj ji, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Yeah. You are muted. <clears throat> Unmute, Unmute yourself. yourself. You are. Uh, we uh, are not able to hear. Yes. Dr. Manoj Mathurji. Yeah. Yours, yeah. Now you are on. Yeah. Yeah. Please continue. One second. One second. Now it is on. All right, sir. All right. Uh, like, you are audible. You are okay. audible. So, you are audible. The screen yeah. also visible. Yeah. Continue. So, I shall be speaking about the professional indemnity for doctors today in this symposium. What is the scope of professional indemnity? It is to provide cover to the extent of financial damage for the loss caused by to the victim against unintentional errors and omissions by the doctor, insured qualified and non-qualified employees and staff. It also covers the cost of defending oneself in the court of law, the, that is the cost of victim. The plan covers for a one-year period. However, the policy does not cover for criminal proceedings. The compensation under professional indemnity policy is the policy will pay the sum assured and that has been set as a limit, not over the limit. The expense over and above the sum assured has to be borne by the doctor. The sum insured is referred to as the limit of indemnity and this limit is fixed per accident and per policy period taken. The indemnity insurance policies should be taken for doctors and hospitals with staff separately and should be renewed every year to meet the claims of the consumer forum. The indemnity policy, what are the options available to the doctors? The doctors can take policies in three ways. Number one, Indian Medical Legal Consulting Services or such other professional protection groups that provide you the policy. Number two, the professional protection scheme of the IMA. And number three, the professional indemnity policies by the uh, by national gen the general car insurance companies can be taken. So the medical legal consulting services or other such professional protection groups, the medical legal company or professional protection groups, that is example, AIOS, IMA, they have a tie-up, will take care of all medical legal problems and administrative problems, whereas routine insurance companies will only indemnify the consumer claims. They won't support you in your activity. You can have insurance with uh, companies like Indian Medical Legal Consulting Services and their website is given. They give support in given consumer litigation. They render services by giving insurance of a nationalized company like National Insurance Company, Oriental, or the United India Assurance Company. The guidance is also given in maintaining the medical legal records, how you have to maintain the records. So they provide round the clock guidance, not just in case of uh, you getting a legal notice. They also give valuable advice in documents, prepare documents and give advisory support and advocate support in all stages of consumer cases, in all consumer forums and appeals till Supreme Court. And in the criminal litigations and in the Medical Council of India actions, the advice and documentation is also done. Whereas the National Protection Professional Protection Scheme, what is the, the aim of this scheme is to protect the members and help them in case of harassment, litigation, etc., which may arise during the process of their professional practice. They also provide legal aid to the members of the scheme. The eligibility criteria for this scheme is only life members of Indian Medical Associations are eligible to become the members of the scheme. AIOS has a tie-up with the IMA for this scheme. So all AIS members, if they are members of the IMA, can opt for this scheme. How does it uh, function? It takes a non-refundable membership fee of 3,000 rupees. Any member can take multiple units. Like if you, you, you can take multiple units of 3,000 rupees to enhance your professional indemnity uh, limit. So the claim amount should be proportionate to the number of units. The first year membership is 3,000 that reduces by 100 rupees each year up to 2,500. So for the, for the first year, you need to pay 3,000. Next year, 2,900. Like that, you reach the limit of 2,500 per unit. And the, what does it cover? The scheme is liable to pay to a member maximum of rupees 5 lakhs as damages for a single case, not more than 10 lakh unit, rupees in a year. So if you take multiple units, for example, instead of one unit, you take four units. In such case, you, you get a cover of 20 lakh rupees. 
Uh, uh, the concerned member shall obey any instruction given by the management of the scheme regarding the case. This is the caveat with national protection scheme. The scheme should not be made a party in case because the scheme is not an insurance company. There lies a difference between an insurance company and the national professional protection scheme of the IMA. They can't be made a party to the litigation because they are not an insurance company. They only help you, they assist you in fighting the case. And in case you need to pay, you have to pay it and the, uh, the protection scheme reimburse you for the same. And should the member be advised by the scheme to file a counter petition in case suppose there is an out of court settlement or if the, there is an adverse judgment against you, if the protection scheme feels that you have a valid case to appeal against the judgment, then you are apply and file claim for monetary damages and defamation, the member is bound to obey. In such cases, a compensation is ordered. Here lies another caveat. In case you win any compensation, 50% of the amount should be limited to the scheme after deducting all expenses. And uh, finally, the doctor's indemnity, that is the national insurance companies. This anybody can take directly with the insurance companies. What does they do? They cater only to consumer claims. The indemnity, any act committed by insured who shall be a registered medical practitioner giving rise to any legal liability to third parties. And the insured includes policy holding and is qualified assistants and the employees named in the proposal. The policy is available for individuals, hospitals, and diagnostic centers. We they have different policies and they also uh, cover the concept of uh, uh, the, uh, what we call, like you know, as Dr. Deshpande was explaining in his talk, the, uh, the, uh, in the implication of the hospital is also taken care of, like you can take policy for yourself, the hospital in such, along with all the consultants and all the hospital staff. The doctor's indemnity, there is one note and caution. It, it, the short policies are not permitted. You have to maintain the policy. These are all yearly policies and you have to keep renewing and you can't take policies for a short term. They have to be live at the time of incident. All claims have to be legally established. However, the company can offer an out-of-court settlement which should be accepted by the claimant. The jurisdiction is all Indian courts and for a group of 200 members or above, there is a group discount and the calculation of premium. This is most important depends on AOA, that is any one accident, AOA limit of 25%, 33%, 50% or 100% and selected for any one year, that is AOY limit of indemnity. What it implies is these two terms are very important for all the doctors to know. AOA, that is any one accident, suppose if you take 25%, even if you take a policy for one crore rupees, for example, for each incident, AOA 25% means you can't claim more than 25 lakhs of indemnity cover. Whereas 33% means three cases in one year, one crore. Or if you say AOA 100% means if you take a policy for 100 or one crore rupees, for every year, for that particular case, you are covered up to a limit of one crore rupees. So the premium varies. The premium will be less for 25% for AOA and like that. And AOY any one year. So this is most important for us to understand. And another clause, the act has to be committed during the period of insurance commencing from the retroactive date and continued thereafter without a break. That means, like suppose you have taken insurance five years back and now there is a claim after say, um, uh, after three years. So now what the company sees is if there is a lapse in payment of re renewal of the payment, that is like in general insurance policies or life insurance policies, you have a leeway of one month grace period to renew your policies, which is not the fact in professional indemnity cases. Even a one week gap, if uh, it occurs, then the retroactive date changes from that day. Suppose there is uh, there, there is a litigation for, you, for your procedure done three years back and last year while renewing, there is a gap 
So your retroactive date shifts to last year and not the three years back. So what is important is the act has to be committed during the period of insurance, commencing from the retroactive date. So from the retroactive date, whenever the claim is then, and then this policy has to be continued thereafter without a break. So it is always very, very important for all of us that there is no grace period in this policy to, you have to understand, and should be mandatorily renewed before the due date. And this is most important for all the PA, all of us who take the, these policies and we have to renew our indemnity policies within the renewal date. Thank you for your patient here. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Mathur. Uh, he has nicely thrown the light on the indemnity insurance. To add something to him, I will say that the Indian Medical Legal Consulting Services can give the indemnity insurance at the rate of one third less than the other normal companies, individual companies giving the aid. So this benefit should be taken by the people and this is not the thing that everybody can take, ophthalmologist and uh, to that the staff also is included in that. Another thing is that refractive surgeries many times are not included in the insur uh, insurance uh, uh, indemnity insurance, but in this, uh, the in, uh, refractive surgeries are also included. So this is the opportunity for ophthalmologists, which they can avail. So I will uh, say that nicely done, Dr. Mathur. Now you, I will request the senior justice Ashok Ganguly. Justice Ashok Ganguly is there. Please, Ashok Ganguly. No, sir, he's not seen. So, I don't see him here, sir. Okay, so I will switch over to our senior advocate, Milan Mukherjee. He will be speaking on criminal case against doctors, how to tackle it. And this is a very important subject which is concerned with all us people. So, I request uh, our oh, yeah. senior advocate, Milan yeah. Mukherjee, please. <laughs> Can yes, you all hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Sir. You see, good evening first, because all renowned people are in front of me who have made a very good ski of what I say, things pertaining to indemnity, insurance and everything. Now I have been given the task of how to tackle criminal cases against the doctors. Now the question here is, there cannot be a foolproof method by which the doctors can be said to have committed an offense. Now, to say this, I will make a small, I'll give you a, lot, uh, the, a small example. The example is that I'm doing a matter in a criminal case of doctors, which started way back on in 2009. The FIR was lodged in 2012, where the names of the doctors were never given. And in 2020, when the charge sheet was filed, Warrant of arrest, non bailable warrant of arrest was issued against eight doctors of Calcutta. Now, the question here is there was no prior intimation, intimation. Now, the question, if we go by, there are two parts to it. One part is the medical negligence part, where you are aware because of the status and the guidelines given in the 2005 judgment of Jacob Matthews. When the guidelines have been given, how a complaint is to be filed, how an arrest has to be made, these are things which have been given in the guideline of the Honorable Supreme Court. But in this case, which I am dealing with, they came to know at night when the police knocked on their door. So the tackling part had to be done on the next day on an urgent basis to see first that the warrant which was issued so that they are not taken into custody because there is no question of following the guidelines as emphasized in the Jacob Matthews case. And I hope everybody of you all is aware of the guidelines given in the Jacob Matthews case, which is still the law prevalent to the humiliation a doctor faces when a criminal case is registered against them. Now, if you see this case, you'll be surprised to note that after 14, 14 years, they have to face the consequence of an act which they have never participated in. They have never participated in that and eight big doctors of Calcutta had to be saved 
by moving an application in the High Court for quashing of their proceedings. The irony of everything is that they were being charged for an offense which cannot be investigated by the police. Now the police cannot do it, but then we have to bring it to the notice of the court and the damages may be done before I can go to the court of law. So the tackling part is, if we have the knowledge that I am uh, accused in this case, I can save them. We can save them. But the question is when out of nothing, something comes to you to say that you have been made an accused in this case. What happens then? Like if you see, as my, one of my learned senior friends here, a doctor friend said, that the hospitals also have a liability towards it. Now, when it comes to the hospital, it becomes a question of the liability of the owners as well as the doctors. Now that doctor is for negligence and for cheating, it is for the, towards the hospital for charging them much more than what was due to them. We have to be very, very careful when it comes to doctors, whether they may be made aware because a doctor faces three prosecutions. First is a criminal prosecution. Second is a civil prosecution, if I may use that word, pertaining to the consumer forum. And the third is the disciplinary authority that is the medical council. So a doctor really practice or he's busy with all these going to courts and doing everything. Where does it stop? Now I had been telling on the last occasion when this conference was held in Calcutta, not visually, Dr. Justice Ganguly was with me in that meeting. I had been very clear that no doctor, no doctor's organization has deemed it fit to challenge the judgment which was pertained in 1996, which made the doctors liable for being prosecuted under the Consumer Protection Act. Now, even the new act, which has come into existence since 2020, nobody has made an effort, neither have we as a party, as a unit written to the government to say, how do we defend or a, a, a litigation? And how do we treat a patient? If the sword is hanging over our head, how do you expect us to do a job thinking that if I do it in a, such a manner, I may be held up for a prosecution. Now we have to be very careful tackling an issue is very easy provided you know that that issue I'm aware of. Because out of the blue, if something happens, how are you going to tackle it? If it is a notice comes to you, I, we know how to tackle it. Because the Matthew, Jacob Matthews guidelines are there. Jacob Matthews says, if these are not followed, no prosecution will lie. But in this case, I was giving you as an illustration, if the warrant of arrest has been issued, the judge is not aware of whether the police has taken it because the warrant is sprayed and they sign it and say, warrant, non billable warrant against the doctors. The ignominy of going to custody for having not committed an offense, how do we protect it? The protection has to come from the body of the doctors. We are there to defend you. We are there, there to make you look innocent in the eye of law. We are there always in, to look after the best interests of the doctors because the profession the doctors are in and the profession we are in is when a person is in distress. A person in distress will only go to a doctor or to a lawyer. So, but the problem is a lawyer has always an excuse to blame it on the judge, whereas the doctor has to blame it on himself which the forums are there for, where they try to find out the faults. Oh, this doctor, he's making a lot of money. He has a lot of people. He has a lot of enemies. So the question here is, the tackling part is when we can come to know about the factum of being aware of the litigation. Unless we know about the litigation, we cannot do the tackling part. Because as I was telling you, any time, any moment, like there's a doctor here who has been facing a prosecution for an act he did in Calcutta, and he's being prosecuted in a Bombay court under Negligence Act. Now, as Moderator had said, 
304A is a bailable offense. It's only a punish for two years. If it is a bailable offense, then there's no question of going into custody. But the fact remains that a doctor has to face a criminal litigation. How do we tackle it is, as I try to impress upon my clients who are doctors with me, I try to, because doctors feel very scared, rightly so, to go before the court of law and that before the magistrate. So my endeavor always has been to ensure that they do not have to appear in any court. I try to move the high court and see that justice is done at the first point of time without waiting for their getting bail, facing a protracted litigation for more than 10 to 20 years. Because the judicial system as of date, especially the criminal courts, when the matter will end, we have, not, we have no answer to it. I think I've made myself clear and thank you very much for giving your patient hearing. Thank you. Uh, Advocate uh, Milan Mukherjee, you have thrown a very good, nice light on the criminal part of it. So now we are having 25 minutes for discussion. Yes. Yes. So now taking into the your uh, talk also, I will go ahead with the discussion to start. Yes. So as you said that uh, in the night, the uh, police came to arrest the doctor. As such, there is a Supreme Court decision that the doctor cannot be arrested unless and until a second opinion of the medical field is taken. Another thing is that doctor can be arrested only on the cognizable offenses not related to the profession. I agree. But when it is related to the profession, there should be a medical board which should give the recognition the, uh, that the doctor can be arrested for the purpose of inquiry. So how you will... Uh, can I clarify? Yeah. I think back. your lordship, uh, your, I'm sorry. No, so I am just, comes uh, out I am a medical person but, with a law degree. I am just, <laughs> so uh, I, just, and I, I will medical just legal person. Thing. I'll just tell you one thing. Yeah. You are absolutely right that the Supreme Court in Jacob Matthews case has made it very clear that no doctors can be arrested. First, if the FIR is lodged, they have to seek, the investigating officer has to seek the permission and the guidance of another doctor who is an, an, in the same state to say that yes, prima facie has committed an offense. The so illustration, yeah. the illustration yeah. I gave you was very simple illustration. In 2009, the incident takes place. 2012, when the FIR is lodged, there is no doctors who have been made an FIR named doctor. In the first information report, no doctor is named as an accused, right? Now this comes into play in 2020, May 2020, when the police submits a charge sheet and names these doctors as accused persons. There, there is no question of uh, opinion prior to that. It is the question of the police submitting a charge sheet and issuing a warrant of arrest. We can only bring it to the court that the wrong committed by the investigating agency only after the issue and we are aware that there is such an incident. Only then, that is the difference we have to understand. Now here, yes. the, taking the opinion of a consultant in that field may be a bias. So why not to be taken a uh, opinion of the medical board or a government of authority like a civil surgeon having a board and inquiry and giving written permission of that board to be that the doctor can be arrested because the matter seems to be like that for the inquiry purposes or other purposes, whatever it may be. And because the meaning of the Supreme Court decision is like that only. Sir, you're right, absolutely. But the question is, I have to bring it to the high court. The judge who issued the warrant of arrest has committed a wrong. That is why I have challenged it and I've got to stay off the warrant of arrest. Yeah, you Dr. Prakash. Yeah, right. I'm taking advantage I of the judgment to say that. I have, I have got a simple question first and then another question. First yes. question is, sir, in case of ladies, uh, she cannot be arrested after sunset. Is it the same that even in the night, the doctors also cannot be arrested? I don't know. No, no, no. No. You can be no, arrested. There is no bar. Okay. Another thing is, sir, 
uh, we have faced few, because I am also the IMA activist in Pune and at other places. We have seen that many more commissioner of police, not only police inspector, but even commissioner of police, they don't know 304 and 304A. Yes. In some of the uh, mis uh, occasions, they have arrested the doctors. And when we met as IMA activists to them and told them that 304 and 304A is different, you cannot apply 304 directly in these cases. They were not knowing about 304 implementation. And then commissioner of police told to that particular police uh, officer <laughs> that not to apply 304. If this is the situation at many more places where the police officers, they do not know the law, then it is uh, very bad on part of medical profession that Absolutely. they may get arrested, that it becomes non bearable if it is 304. And Correct. the doctors remain in custody for two to three days unnecessarily. Minimum, so, minimum. Yeah. yeah. You see, this the part three and four, it's a, it's, there are two parts to it, 299 and 300. One is a culpable homicide, not about the to murder, which comes under the garb of section 304. Right? Culpable is not a murder, is 302. Now, 304, capital A, relates to rash and negligent act causing death where the punishment is two years and bailable in nature. So the arrest part is, is not necessarily because you always get bailed whenever you surrender or whatever you do. So that is a thing which has to be, now that is what I'm trying to say that the, the your, your organization or Dr. Parthavi, all of you are there. Y'all should have a committee where y'all should be on a monthly basis having consultations with lawyers, having consultations with people who are aware of the law. Because once the damage is done, then you get the release. We don't want the damage to be done at the first point of time. Yeah, this yeah, is right, we I have to be I very careful. Dr. Dr. Manoj Chandra I'll, wants I'll to speak something. I'll ask Dr. Manoj's question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, what uh, Mr. Milan Mukherjee raised an issue is very dangerous for the doctors, actually. An in incident that has happened 10 years ago, an FIR is lodged, the FIR doesn't name all the doctors, any doctors, and the police took 10 years to investigate, <laughs> and as Dr. Deshpande said, they might have taken a expert opinion also before filing the charge sheet. Now the doctors are unaware that there is a charge sheet against them. Suddenly their names are revealed and overnight they are arrested. So is, does that make a case for the arrest, sir? Like as you were saying, you appealed against that kind of an action in the court of law? And I got it straight. So it will go. So you got that it order will not remain. Exactly. You are right. Exactly. That, that is what I'm saying. That all, that, but that you must be aware if we yeah. are tackling it. But prior, we are not aware of yeah. the economy yeah. of a warrant being against you. That even a, yes. one of the finest doctors of yes. Calcutta. Yes. Something they can't digest also. It is a bolt from the blue for the doctors. Like yes, the absolutely. You are absolutely water. right. Yes, Prakash Marathe yes, was wanting yes, to say something. Sir, there is, uh, there is one law in the state of Maharashtra that is Doctors Protection Act. Achha. The same type, aware. the same type of a law we were asking at the center level, but unfortunately it couldn't get passed because what government felt that if this protection is given to doctors, I think other professions like journalists and others will also ask the same. But even in Maharashtra, when this implementation of Doctors Protection Act is being done, most of the times the culprits, they are not getting punished properly by the police and even the court of law. Most of the times they get bail and after taking that bail, they again start troubling the doctors and hospitals. What is your opinion and comment? Okay. So the problem is, as you have rightly said, the Doctors Protection Act by it, the nomenclature it says, it seems that the doctors have to be protected from act of vandalism act of arson and all these things. Now, when a mob violence happens, these are very difficult. It is good on paper, but in reality, these will never work. I'll be honest with you. It will never work even uh, if you react the act. Uh, sir, no, no. After, once the incidence has happened, yes. probably whatever loss of property and damage to the hospital, damage to the persons in the hospital, after that, they are supposed to fulfill that particular damage. And even they have to be arrested properly and punishment has to be given. What that is the punishment? Is lacking. What is the punishment? I'm not aware of the act. What is no, the, the act is there, sir. And yeah. that act says 
that whenever there is something done by the patients of the mob to the hospital, damaging the property or damaging or uh, beating the doctor or making phys physical assault to the doctor, criminal cases can be lodged against those people immediately and that should be a cognizable offense and should be arrested immediately. Secondly, the twice of the loss which has happened and uh, given by the doctor and judged and finalized should be given to the hospital for the loss of the property or damage to the property. And that is in the form of giving damages from the pockets of the convicted people or the uh, people who are alleged to have. So, so this is the law. Yeah. But could you tell me what is the punishment <laughs> if, or under the Doctors Protection Act? Then I can give you an input. I think uh, what I know, what I know is probably it was three years. Hence, be it becomes bailable. We are we are insisting that it should be seven years so that it becomes non-bailable and the person goes behind the bar. Sir, I'll tell you what. Now, if it is three years, it is tribal by a magistrate. Now, the magistrate has an embargo on the amount of fine he can give. <laughs> that embargo is five thousand rupees. If it is the chief judicial magistrate, then there is no limits to it. You get my point. Now, there are two parts to it. One is the criminal act for which you should be punished and sent into custody. The other part is recovery of money towards the damages done. Yes, now, correct. you are right, sir. You are right. So, so yes, that sir. is what I'm trying to say. Recovery of the money cannot be a part of the CGM's court. It is the punishment which can be meted out by the magistrate's uh, court. So there is a provision, I think so, that right. the penalty is given as in the form of fine and the order is made out of that fine. This much should go to the hospital or doctor because there is an actual damages to that. And the criminal law as such, whatever the criminal law says whether the doctor is killed, whether the doctor has sustained a severe a grievous injury or a simple injury or a cut injury or a uh, fire arm, whatever, so yes. whatever it may be, that is the punishment according to the injury which is sustained to the doctor and health workers also, not only the doctors, all the so staff. There is one provision. Supposing yeah. it is a tribal as has been brought to my notice. Yeah. That there is one provision where <laughs> if the magistrate thinks that the punishment which I can give yeah. is big here, is not, it should be more. He has a power under 325. Yeah. Commit, of commit, statute, commit the session. So the session. Not, not commit. Here uh -huh. he can send it to the chief judicial magistrate for punishment in accordance with law, where the fine is any amount of money, not 5,000 rupees. No, that, that is is money part is different. Money part is different. No, no, if no. There is fine a murder, part. I'm saying the fine part. And yeah. when you rely, realize the fine part and yeah. the amount from the fine part is given to the doctors or to yeah. the hospital, then out of 5,000 is something and an unlimited amount is there under 325 of the CRP. Yeah, yeah, that is true. And accordingly, if there is a murder of the doctor or there is a grievous injury, or privation of the part, then that case can be case uh, case will be committed to the session for trial, and that will go to there the session. So I'll yeah. give you a difference here. Yeah, because Ozzy that is all involved in hurt. that. Causing grievous hurt has yeah. four sections. Yeah, one is a voluntary causing hurt, one is a voluntary causing hurt by grievous weapons, one is see, grievous hurt, and the other is three twenty six, which relates to punishment. Imprisoned for life, but tribal by a magistrate. Yeah. So even though there is a three prison for life, the magistrate tries those offenses. Even These if are there the is a, of yeah. our Indian yeah. penal code. Yeah, even if there is a no assault, there can be a case of trespass. A trespass that is also a, done. A trespass is a bailable offense that nothing for. Yeah. yeah. It is a question of a continuing trespass. Yeah. <laughs> trespass is nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? So, I mean, it was a pleasure talking to you all, sir. I, yeah, you know, we will continue the, another 15 minutes we are left with. So, because matter, we sir. have got oh, a criminal lawyer matter. with us, we will be happy to discuss with you. Definitely. <laughs> yes, please, Mathur. Uh, Dr. Amit Shah is there. Yes. Dr. Pankaj yes, is Amit Shah. there. Yes, Please, you. Amit Shah. Anybody else? Dr. Amit Shah, please. Something.
Yes. Yes, yes, please. Yes, yes Dr. Shah, please. See, basically, uh, when there is a medical legal case, the patient has nothing. I, I mean, I'm talking about preparatory surgery. Patient has, uh, you know, uh, six, nine vision, and then they complain in the readers of complete fail or something. Then what will be the outcome? Which one, sir? I, I couldn't get your question, sir. I couldn't get your question, sir. A patient of, uh, you know, having spectacles, undergone basic surgery, okay? Yes. And he's having vision of six, nine, both eyes. Uh -huh. Okay, one line less than six six. Okay, and he is complaining in this consumer court. The result. So I will explain his question nicely to you in your language. The surgery before the surgery, patient was blind or having less vision, and after the surgery, the surgery was successful from the part of the doctors, and the patient has got a good vision. That is ninety ninety five percent. That is six nine vision, but still the patient says. I am neglected and I have got less vision and I have da had damage to my vision. And so he goes to the consumer courts. So this will not hold water. Can you stop dogs from barking? Yeah, that is the you thing. You cannot stop them that, from that barking. We have to prove. <laughs> so it is not proving. If it is, he's got his vision back. Then he got it 6 9, you say. So but these, the, these are all the judges may be different, sir. So sir, these are it all is, harassment suits. Yes, harassment suits are there. Huh. There are suits to gain the money also because the now in the new Consumer Protection Act, yes. there is a provision of more than one crore can be ordered by the, the district for uh, commission only. And another thing is that very bad part of it, the uh, manufacturing act that uh, the service provider, the inborn uh, shortcomings of the services and under that also he can be blamed. So I there are so many things. You, so I'm yeah. repeatedly telling you all, there should be a review of the judgment where you all have been deemed to be a party to the consumer forum. They, I'm another, repeatedly uh, telling them you all should move the Supreme Court for uh, which is very difficult, I sir. Which is very difficult. Another thing, you must have gone through the Consumer Protection Act very nicely, yes. more than me. But there is another provision of mediator. The mediator is able to mediate in between the um, uh, consumer and the service provider. So, whenever a patient gets something uh, out of the hospital, some surgery, the advocates who, who are, sorry, sir. So I'm no, saying are, advocate. Uh, we are very, very much sorry, but no, no, you're right. I'm not sorry. I get them I, that just sign here and you will get at least five, ten lakhs. You just sign and go. Don't worry. Right, and they will right. put a case of one crore and will if the case goes to the mediator, mediator will compromise. He the advocate will be ready to compromise. Doctor will be also happy to compromise five, ten lakhs, and this five, ten lakhs goes from the either the India intimacy uh, insurance or the from the pocket of the doctor without any reason without doing any wrong thing by the doctor and this may happen in future or probably happening at present but fortunately right, at present mediators sir, are not sir, that you have much to understand what yeah. they say what they say in uh, USA the yeah. uh, who goes beyond uh, when a person dies their yeah. advocates who run after them yeah, yeah. So, yeah, in India, it is happening so, sir. So it is not for only absolutely. in the US. You're right, it is you're happening right. in India. A right. lot of suits I am dealing with. I am a lot of suits which are there, which are only for the earning of the money and nothing more. So we can't help it, sir. What can we uh, do? May I have one question, sir? Please. Yeah. Now, uh, recently, this new CPA, Consumer Protection Act mm -hmm. 2019 20, 20. came. Yeah. Uh, there was the rumor or there was the news that medical profession is kept aside of that particular law. No, no. That was one interpretation. Yeah. Other interpretation was medical profession is not kept aside. It is included in that consumer protection. Act. Right. We have got few interpretations. I want to know from your side, what is your interpretation? My interpretation is the medical professions is included in the new act. The, that is the mischief of the secretary who has yeah. done that. The uh, Sir, parliament or the Now, definition is now 242. 
not limited word they have added and they added, 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 added up to and that included everything that that was the word added by the secretary not by the uh, uh, that is the parliament or the uh, anywhere else there was a big discussion that the medical profession should be omitted and uh, everybody was accepting nearly was accepting it you, and uh, the, that was nearly accepted but the secretary when they prepared the law just put a simple word uh, quoted, i think quoted, uh, quoted, quoted, quoted. one one uh, interpretation what i had heard sir mukherjee sir yes, that sir. because there was the list in that particular list medical profession was not written so people thought because it is not written it is not included but one more interpretation was there is an exclusion list suppose medical profession is written in the exclusion list then it is really excluded Yes, that was the interpretation that I heard. Uh, but medical profession is not there in the exclusion yes. list. Let from is, Mukherjee say. Yeah, please, Mukherjee. Yes, sir. What is your opinion on Marathi's question? No, there is no exclusion. It will be medical services. Yeah. So this is a mischief, and uh, we have to fight for that exclusion to the uh, Supreme Court. And if you can do it. we will be away from no this to me consumers. because i'm a criminal lawyer i'm not a constitutional lawyer or a consumer lawyer nobody yeah. comes to me even your dr biswas doesn't come to me i, I have to go to him even dr yeah. patko bisha doesn't come to me for any legal help yeah what can i do i can't go and say please come to me please come to me i can't say that you ask dr bisha she doesn't come to me i have to go to him because of my eye problems yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you have to tell him <laughs> so any more any more questions one Amit question Shah? one question Third? mr mukherji please yes like please. why is it only limited Sabina, to huh? oh, yeah negligence yes. Uh, yes. law limited to only medicine why not for other professions why is there no law of negligence in the other for the other professions so we have a appeal forum we have a judge who looks out you are your own judge and uh, when you are doing an interview. operation yeah. you are not guided by anybody else it's your own case you are doing your own case we do a case but subject to the judge there that is the best part of us that is why we got the escape route thank you the speakers <laughs> and thank you, so so thank you for a nice discussion and we have finished our session within time before 5 minutes or something like that and yes. we will be handing over to the hall to the other uh um, people so only one thing before we yeah. leave yeah yeah the amount of money which has been saved by not giving us snacks not giving us mementos <laughs> what happens that <laughs> that <laughs> is the <laughs> organizers who the lady knows has the lady i am has just a chairman of the session i am <laughs> not a small person organizers can say <laughs> yes, that. that is what i'm trying I'm, to say uh, dr deshpande sir i request you to virtually uh, felicitate sir and yeah. uh, virtually thank him no no it's virtually sorry. i felicitate uh, advocate uh, milin mukherjee thank virtually you. i felicitate all the speakers i also want and to... honor and amit shah who was not a speaker but a chairman also in co chairman and some other people who have attended as a chairpersons and on the dais i felicitate them virtually and thank you thank you all Thank you. Thank, 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 thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful thank session. Enjoyed it, all of us. Thank you, doctors, for the wonderful session. Thank you for being a part of the seventy ninth AIOC virtual conference. We conclude this hall now.